Good afternoon. This is Guillermo Salatier, Director of International Services for HSI and the Health and Safety Institute. And uh, welcome to the show, Perspectives on Energy. Uh, we have quite a bit to talk about today. Uh, a lot going on, not just in the U.S., but also in Europe, given um, the latest uh, issues with uh, meeting supply and demand uh, and uh, different types of energy crisis that we're seeing in California versus the West Coast. And then, of course, uh, comparing that to Western Europe and their constraints on natural gas. So we're, we're going to. Today, I'm going to discuss some of the things that got us here, what the, I guess, the nomenclature is for the energy emergency alerts that they're using in California, and uh, what what got us here, uh, in a way, right? Um, I'll try not to go into a rant, but uh, some of the reasons that we are in this place is because uh, legislation that was done way ahead of uh, all the key stakeholders, right? Fi finally, we're seeing we're seeing the uh, grid operators, the, the engineers, the the SMEs that have the technical background um, invited to the table and, and having part in the conversation on how to bring about this uh, renewable this push towards uh, mostly renewables well we just can't have 100 percent renewables not feasible and we're seeing that happen this week uh so let's start off with uh california and what's happening with that particular part of the world at this time and it's not a lot of fun to be there they're now on their i believe ninth day of what they call flex alerts uh normally what what uh, happens there is uh this is common to see in an e energy emergency alert level two an eea2 uh so what is an eea uh NERC has uh, different levels of energy emergency alerts, the acronym is EEA, and they go from one to two to three, and then all the way to zero, which is a cancellation of the alert. Uh, EEA one uh, basically says that you are now have every available resource online and you have you're you're just about meeting you're, you are meeting your load you're meeting your demand right uh, as long as you don't lose any power plants or there's no unexpected change to the forecast you should be able to meet that load right and that is what an eea1 is about uh, usually that's issued uh in the mornings uh long before you 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 approach the afternoon peak especially now given that it's, it's summer and and we're, we're in the middle of the heat um it, and according to NERC, right, it's uh, it's using the real-time analysis. Uh, it, it tells you every resource you have available has been committed. Uh, that means generation. That means purchases. That means uh, any plant that was sh uh, on a reserve shutdown has been brought online. You've got plenty of fuel to make it. But if you have, a, for example, a 10,000 megawatt uh, peak load expected, and, and you only have a 10,000 megawatt uh, total supply, and, and that's it, including all your reserves, you are issuing an EEA level one. Um, at this point, right, uh, you can actually make it through that day. Unfortunately, right, um, if you happen to lose a generator or you happen to have a problem with one of your uh, transmission lines or your corridors, well, that could easily put you into an EEA too, right? Uh, say you you have lost a generator, well, now you are no longer able to supply uh, the load by the amount of your loss. So um, you, usually in the mornings as well, if your expectation is that you're getting to the point where you have every available resource running, and now you're getting to the point where you're issuing the flex alerts, just like uh, California has. Well, this is an example of an EEA2, where in this case, you're asking for, you're appealing for load reduction, whether you're asking them to, uh, whether it's voluntary or involuntary in some cases, you're asking them to reduce their consumption, turn off uh, lights that don't need to be on, to set their thermostats up to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, um, essentially is reducing the amount of consumption, right? So uh, it, in this case, right, their consumers are urged to, con to conserve energy. Um, there's different applications as well. Uh, they may have an on-call uh, or on-demand program in which a customer's paid uh, a monthly fee to take part in this. And what they'll do is that they will shut down water heaters or pool pumps for a certain period of time. And then eventually they may even shut down air conditioners involuntarily at this point. Um, usually once that happens, you're, you're getting pretty close to actually having to rotate feeders. So that is an EEA too. Um, you're still able to meet the load, but, but um, 
it's it's going to have to happen with the help of the, the customers by cutting down or curtailing their own consumption, right? Or by activating your on-demand systems where you're you're shutting off ACs, pool pumps, water heaters. Usually, water heaters first, then pool pumps, and then at the very last resort is air conditioners. In some other cases, they even have a commercial and industrial load control where they they'll notify the um, commercial customers that take part in this program that they're going to shut them off for maybe one or two hours right during that peak and then the these customers get ready at that point whether it's a production line or they have something that consumes, consumes a lot of energy whether it's a factory or something some big industrial facility they will of course curtail and then shut down for those few hours and then they're compensated for that uh, the time that they're off so that's an eea2 in a nutshell and eea3 is um really a place you don't want to be that is uh, the that iso or that balancing authority is unable to meet their minimum contingency reserves right meaning that um, they are not able to meet their load uh if they if they uh, they simply are going to have to start rotating feeders um they're about to rotate feeders or or they are already in the process of rotating feeders and and what does that mean right so you have feeders one through 10 out of a station and you have many, many stations. And one of the things they're doing is they're going to rotate feeders one, three, and five. They're going to turn them off, for example, uh, 15 minutes, and then they'll, they'll go ahead and turn off feeders two and two and four, and then they'll restore feeders one and three, and then they'll stagger that way uh, on for, you know, usually five to 15 minutes each. Um, and then they'll rotate through those feeders until finally the, uh, the the peak is over and they're able to recover from this. Clearly, that has a huge uh, customer impact there. And then that has a lot of like reportable events to the Department of Energy and FERC. And that, that of course, has a, a lot more, a lot greater number of consequences for the entity. Um, so California right now, they're on their ninth day of issuing those EEA-2s, and they even issued an EEA-3 at some point, I believe. So they, they got pretty close. Um, nine days, nine days. And granted, they have unprecedented heat, they have uh, fires, they have issues with uh, the renewables. So they have a lot of renewable resources that sadly they're dependent on and not a lot of flexible base load. Uh, a lot of their combustion site, combustion turbines, their simple cycle turbines, their combined cycle turbines are, what they have is running and maxed out. And and sadly to say is, is a lot of the generating resources that they had a year ago, two years ago, that of course burned some natural gas fossil fuel have now been shut down. And what replaces them? Well, what the replacement has been renewable resources. Uh, that's well and good, and it's great for the environment. However, it's it, it, now we see some of the shortfalls when you're dealing with a, a resource that is highly variable. Uh, in this case, for example, they have a lot of solar resources that are being impacted by uh, cloud cover mixed with smoke from other fires, and then the output of these solar sites are not as expected. Same thing is happening with wind, a uh, highly variable resource. So in this case, it's also having an impact on the reliability. Uh, not to mention the fact that there there's now constraints and limits on how much power they are able to import from other regions, as even if there was power. So at this time, a lot of the hydroelectric facilities that are in neighboring areas are also suffering from an unprecedented level of uh, well, drought that has not been seen in a long time. So for them, uh, the production of power isn't quite where it was before. So in this case, you're looking at a, at a just not enough resources to be able to meet that demand. And a lot of that should, should you know, I believe it has been a product of, uh, or the result of rushing ahead with a lot of this legislation to move towards renewables at a highly accelerated and a very aggressive rate, uh, incentivizing, for example, the construction of uh, solar and wind but, and then while well, at the same time penalizing the, uh, the, the, uh, maintenance and the construction of uh, typical combined cycle or simple cycle combustion turbines that burn natural gas. And uh, now we're seeing the effects of that, right? Where, where it's like they don't have the flexibility to be able to do this. And 
things have gotten so 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 dire in that in that regard. It's you're seeing an example of uh, Diablo Canyon, which was the last nuclear plant that's remaining in California. And over the last decade, you know, there has been a strong effort to get that plant shut down, and uh, along with the fact that it just became more and more expensive to operate, until ultimately, you know, the PG and E decided to go ahead and uh, schedule it for shutdown. And it, it got to the point where it's no longer economic to keep it running. So now, apparently, um, the state has decided to uh, assist PG&E with uh, keeping the plant running for, for a number of more. I mean, I think it's a good five or six years to keep it online uh, just to offset PG&E's cost of operating. Even though the state spent a considerable amount of money to get that plant shut down. So now they're paying, they're paying a lot to keep that plant online, given the... Um, the uh, supply of, uh, of of megawatts versus the expected load. So that, that's an example of where we're at, um, just in that state. Uh, the other example, of course, is, is 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 the in the recent news was the mandating proposed legislation. It isn't quite law yet, but the proposal was to um, make it such that only EVs or electric vehicles will be sold in California. Uh, after 2035, which is a very great ambitious goal. I mean, hey, my wife has a Tesla. I mean, I I see the benefit. I see the economics behind it. It's great. She has to commute 70 miles a day. I mean, it's a 35 mile round trip. So there's definitely a fraction of the cost that she would be paying if it were a uh, internal combustion vehicle, right? But here's the issue. It's uh, when you mandate something in that way, uh, you, you just cannot legislate renewables as imagined, and it's kind of the title of this whole episode right it's uh they 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 make these mandates and the infrastructure isn't there and so much so that they of course issue one of the flex alerts where they ask uh, ev drivers not to charge their vehicles during peak hours so very bad optics uh on the part of the california government state government and 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 that and that kind of changes the, the view people are having right when it comes to what sort of wisdom is behind this legislation and are they even coordinating this with the utilities right uh clearly there needs to be a greater level of investment in infrastructure and of course you know it's it's um the need to have a more diversified energy portfolio is rather important and we're seeing this here and speaking of diversified energy portfolios, um, let's jump over to Europe. And we're seeing what's happening there. Um, years ago, uh, this whole this whole change from from their their they had quite the mix of uh, of uh, generation over there in Europe. Um, of course, France was 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 very very. Um, I think the between seventy eighty percent of their portfolio was nuclear. And it was dispatchable nuclear, which means they could actually uh, move the output of those generators on a daily basis. Whereas here in the U.S., we tend to put a generating unit online as nuclear. It comes online and it, and it stays at at a, at a set maximum output for almost 18 months until they have to bring it down for a refueling outage. Uh, that's the main difference. Of course, that, that stretches the maintenance cycle. Uh, whereas in France, the, the maintenance cycle is a lot shorter because, you know, running a unit up and down and... It's almost like uh, cruise control, and you keep changing it, right? You to take it off cruise control, and you're basically uh, accelerating and decelerating as needed, right? So that's the main example. Um, that's the analogy there. So France, it appears now, will be providing, will be selling Germany quite a bit of energy. Um, and a lot of that comes from nuclear. Uh, Germany, uh, I think, did away with all of their coal and all of their um, nuclear power plants. Uh, so, of course, they became highly dependent on natural gas, a lot of combustion turbines or a lot of repowered coal plants that once burned coal, now they've been repowered to burn natural gas. So what's the effect of that? And where were they getting that gas from? Well, a lot of that gas is coming from Gazprom, which is the uh, Russian energy company. And, of course, once this uh, crisis in the Ukraine started, that that was that was predictably one of the first things that would be impacted, right? Of course, it didn't happen right away. Um, years ago, as Europe, Western Europe, moved uh, towards this whole greener greener energy economy, 
they they had to get their natural gas from somewhere and they became more and more dependent on Russian gas. Uh, and this is the issue, you know, having like a, a, a single source in your portfolio or having a single fuel, even if you're getting it from multiple different suppliers, just that single source or that, that single type of fuel is you're, you're at, at a greater amount of risk. I mean, there are utilities here in the U.S. that, again, no, almost 70 percent of their portfolio is natural gas. Uh, they have a variety of, of, of power plants, but they all run natural gas and they're highly dependent on these pipelines, and there's not a lot of them. Uh, so with Europe, now we're seeing the effects of that change as well. So where they had to go ahead and uh, power off some of these coal-fired plants, they had to repower them, and then so now they're changing some of their rules. They're going they're going to bring some of those coal burners back online. Um, the other issue now will be, of course, sourcing uh, that coal that it's adequate to burn in these plants. So that's going to be a whole new challenge as well. So Europe may may have an interesting winter coming up. Uh, right now they're struggling to you know to to work with cooling. Uh, of course, uh, usually um, their energy needs are, are are quite extensive. And as they approach now, they're finally starting to see some cooler days in uh, some parts of Europe, and hopefully that'll offer some relief. But the real concern is what's going to happen this winter. Um, they're they're highly dependent on that natural gas for heating, and um, certain parts of Europe, it's just not 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 a very comfortable place to live if you, if you don't have adequate heating, especially in northern Europe. Uh, Germany, for sure, it's is going to feel Switzerland um, and other 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 European countries that that are that of course at one point were highly dependent on uh, Russian gas. I'm not having to find alternatives. Uh, I do know that that we are shipping them um, liquefied petroleum gas uh, over there, and of course that, that the price of that is much much higher than they were paying before for their for, for their Russian gas, and th this is um, of course another alternate source for them, but not very sustainable. So as we approach the end of the summer, it's really interesting to see what's going to happen, um, but. What is the effect of all this, right? I mean, what lessons have we learned, at least from from th this crisis and all these issues, whether it's here, California, parts of the West, um, even of course, and then Europe, right? Well, it, it's it's this this push towards 100% renewables that that has forced its way into into effect through legislation is usually a, a problem when it comes to reliability. Um, Sadly, it's it's only until recently uh, they 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 were not including the stakeholder you know all stakeholders in this process, namely the uh, the uh, technical side of of uh, those who manage the power grids, those who manage the resources, and um, and now we see the effects of that, right? So ideally, as as this legislation moves forward and. Uh, I suspect we're going to see some changes in the way that they they'll they'll, they'll write it. Uh, there's always going to be some kind of like um, need to have a diversified portfolio of energy. Um, you cannot have 100% renewable energy uh, and not have these sorts of problems. Not at the current state of technology that that, that we are in right now. Uh, there's going to be some natural gas. There, we have plenty of natural gas to burn, and, and when you compare that to oil or coal, it, it's it's fractional. The emissions are just fractional of what oil or coal were. So we have finally moved away, right? As as a nation, they used to burn coal. Well, we used to burn oil. We, we still have a lot of coal burning units in 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 the country, but converting those to natural gas is is feasible as long as there's a, a pipeline nearby. Um, the other thing we're going to see, and this this is something that we're 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 marching towards this regardless of what, what's happening, is is we're we're going to see a comeback of nuclear. We're going to see a comeback, of, and it won't be those large, multi-billion dollar investment uh, facilities. They're going to be the smaller, small modular reactors, uh, usually some that are between thirty to fifty megawatts, and you're going to see hundreds of those, maybe thousands of those throughout the country. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of opposition you, you, you're, they're going to face, um, but it's very difficult to, to be able to meet these climate goals without having this additional resource in there, especially uh, having a dispatchable nuclear 
nuclear power plant that's small, uh, whether it's a small modular reactor or a micro modular reactor. Uh, the other thing too, as well, is that is uh, the use of distributed energy resources, right? So that's on the bright side of renewables, right? It's uh, customers that have solar and they have uh, EVs at their home, right? That that at some point will be changed and that will be treated as a resource by the utilities. In fact, there's a there's a utility in Florida that's currently offering an incentive where um, they will they will pay for the level two EV charger. They will pay for the labor and uh, which you know having an electrician come in and install it, pull, uh, do all the permitting, and uh, on top of all that, give you unlimited off-peak charging for a mere thirty-six dollars a month, but with a ten-year commitment. Right. So the reason they're doing this, and 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 look for us char charging a Tesla uh, in Florida at least, uh, if you're if you're if you're commuting seventy miles a day, you know you're 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 looking at about. 1,400, maybe 2,000 miles a month, uh, that's about $100, $110 in charging, right? So so that's charging the car every day. So so imagine charging that same type of charging at $36 a month, where it already covered the expense of a charger. So so clearly that they're, they're, they're subsidizing something uh, in order to get ahead of this curve. Um, my suspicion is that eventually they're going to start using this as a form of um, dispatching the actual distributed energy resource, meaning they're going to use their, their, they'll pay the customer likely for the ability to dispatch those um, EVs and those uh, inverters or those uh, power walls, for example, or even change the output of those like solar, uh, solar panels. And a lot of that's feasible and available. The software is there and that will definitely have a more granular impact and a more precise impact on the power grid at the distribution level. So those are the things that we're seeing, right? And, and these changes are coming, and um, it'll be it'll be fascinating and really exciting times to watch when it comes to our, our industry and uh, how that technology will develop. Um, and one of the last things I think that that we have to think about as well, right, is is um, a lot of these utilities, you know, they 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 would really like to work in partnership with these uh, renewable these renewable legislations right so so uh up until now they've been largely excluded whenever these uh these mandates were where it's like carbon emission mandates or 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 a certain number of uh, uh these very ambitious emissions goals that they would set right by 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 a certain decade or a certain number of years so now it seems that they're that they're including the utilities in these conversations especially the legislators on the other side as well legislators themselves are becoming far more educated in how the grid works and what the constraints are for um, these generating resources and 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 what investment is required in our um, bulk electric system in, in the grid throughout the country so hopefully with, with this new Build Back Better plan uh, and how how the resources are available there to go ahead and make, make those investments, uh, I think it's going to be about four or five years before we see significant changes that, that will impact our ability to actually meet this new uh, electric vehicle load, while at the same time uh, having ample generation. Uh, renewable alone won't be able to do it, right? And, and uh, I think... Uh, so small modular reactors are going to be the key. Uh, a lot of folks won't like to hear that, but um, it's a technology that, that really uh, we've fallen behind in compared to the rest of the world. Uh, we haven't built, a, we've only built one new nuclear reactor since 1979, and that's the Vogel over there in uh, the Southern Company. So uh, the technology is there. There's a lot. There's far better and safer technology in, in use in other places that, that they're going to imply and be able to use. So um, I look forward to seeing that. The other last, the other last thing I want to point out to is is of course to get you know get involved uh, with your legislative process, right? Uh, just setting a lofty goal. And, and I've been to to uh, political conventions, right? Where where. Uh, a former vice president, a real nice person, right, was there, and a lot of the discussion was about passing laws for to address climate change. And and I remember I, I introduced myself as an engineer, and that you know I've, I I work in the industry, and and one of the things was that no, will and one of the things that 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 really shocked me, right, was the attitude of like no, we'll pass the laws, 
and then the industry and technology will will rise up and catch up to the law and that's not the best approach <laughs> so anyway so that's kind of like a takeaway i have here if if they keep doing that trying to legislate rather than working with with, with the industry to actually get there with a realistic goal uh this will ultimately impact reliability and we're seeing the example of that this week in california so and then of course we're also seeing the impact of that uh, if, with extraordinary events in Europe and how uh, they're being impacted by the war in Ukraine. So ultimately, uh, again, it's it's involving the experts in the process, you know, and and uh, working together in partnership would be the best way to be, be able to reach those uh, climate goals when it comes to reducing emissions. And uh, by the way, thank you for uh, tuning in today. That's all I have. And I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.